We're here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and it is the month of May, which means it's time for the Indianapolis 500. But the month of May is also Mental Health Awareness Month. And we are here with a couple of the drivers from the IndyCar Series and the Indianapolis 500 to start a conversation about mental health. This is no means the end of our conversation and it will continue beyond the month of May. But we are here and joined by Sage Karam, Dalton Kellop, and Callum Eilat to talk a little bit about mental health and what it means to us as racing drivers. We turn into turn one at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway at 230 miles an hour. We all have no fear, but when it goes wrong or we go back to the bus, go home at the end of the race weekend, what does that mean for us as drivers? And Sage, I know you've been really open and honest this year about the challenges and the process you worked through after that crash in Pocono quite a few years ago. Um, and then going back and, and reopening some of that trauma. And now this year, you have a plan to close the loop. How hard has it been to not only work through that, but also share your story and encourage other people who maybe need some help to reach out and find it? Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, you know, I was uh, pretty young when when the trauma happened uh, at Pocono, and um, I think I was about 20 years old. So, you know, when you're young like that, it's, uh, it's a pretty difficult time, you know, and you don't really know how to handle a situation like that. And, um, you know, I, I had a lot of things thrown at me and, and just trying to juggle everything at once. And, um, you know, I needed to get proper help, so I, I worked with a sports psychologist my whole life basically when I got into single seaters and um, you know and he was he was really essential for me to get through this whole um, trauma phase and um, you know I think for me it was uh, it was a really dark time you know I went through some serious depression and and had to rely on family friends um, you know racing the racing community um, but sometimes that was hard you know because uh, we have big platforms and social media can be brutal sometimes and um, you know everything wasn't you know the best thing said on online and when you're a young kid of course like you know you want to load up Twitter and, and Instagram and stuff all the time and um, you know that was hard but um, for me I think the hardest part was that I was going through so much stuff um, and at the time I think it wasn't a lot of people weren't very open to talking about mental health and um, I was scared to to bring it up publicly about going through depression and stuff like that because I didn't know how I'd be you know looked at you know by by the public or by my peers and fans and you know everybody and um, it took a long time and then through the years you know you start to see um, really big name people you know and in sports and not even sports just everywhere um starting to come out and and say how they are dealing with some demons and stuff like that and um when you think everyone has these incredible lives on social media and everything you know everyone's battling something right so um it became more socially acceptable to talk about it and um you know i took the time i needed and just felt it's appropriate now for me to come out and talk about the struggle i had to go through and um you know, where I am now in the journey. And like you said, I do have a plan going forward. And the last part of that plan is to go back to Pocono and race. And, you know, I'm going to be going back there later this year to race in the Xfinity race. And for me, that's just mostly just to go back there and race and, and close that chapter and have a good experience. That sounds great. And I appreciate you sharing that story, um, both here and through through other publications. And And moving to Dalton, Sage talked about sports psychologists. And we all, as athletes, have physical trainers and sports psychologists as mental trainers on performance, how important do you think it is to have that resource for recovery? You know, we, I think we all talk about getting sports massages and, and doing rehab over injuries and things like that. How important is it to have that recovery resource on the mental health side? Yeah, so I've been working with a sports psychologist, Dana Sinclair, for the last number of years, probably four or five years. and. Um, I think the, you know, your mental recovery and your sort of, especially when you have a condensed schedule back-to-back -back weekends, if you have a bad race, your ability to kind of brush that off, learn from the lessons that, you know, you can learn from whatever the, the mistake was. For instance, I crashed out halfway through the race a couple days ago, and we're going to be on, we're going to be on, going to be on track tomorrow. So that recovery and just, you know, being able to sort of have tools and strategies to help you be in a good mindset, ready to perform when you have it the next time because we are professionals and that you know our 
livelihood and our teams and sponsors rely on our performance and we have to make sure we take care of our minds to be in 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 the right state to go out there and do do what 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 we need to do so i would say it's as important if not you know almost more important than being physically ready because if, if you're not in that right mindset you won't perform and as a racing driver I don't think you can let fear creep in at all because when you're trying to hold the throttle flat around the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, you can't be afraid. How do you reconcile that mindset with the vulnerability or perceived vulnerability? And, and personally, I think it's it takes a strong mindset to be able to ask for help. Um, but how do you reconcile that with the perceived vulnerability of, of needing help to recover and forget those mistakes and move on to the next event, the next challenge, the next result. Yeah, I think like Sage talked about, you know, your sort of support system that you have, whether it's your your spouse, your parents, your friends and family, and 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 or a sports psychologist that you're working with, you know, almost having the the ability or the sort of willingness to be vulnerable with those people and, and tell them about the issues that you're having. I think that's the, the first step and kind of almost the, the hardest part is actually being open. And, you know, I think from a very young age in a lot of sports, and th th this mindset I think is slowly changing, but the kind of previous mindset was that, you know, you work really hard and it's all about hard work and being tough and all that. And there's a time for that. Like all of us work hard. E everyone that races at the Annapolis Motor Speedway in the NTT IndyCar Series, like we all work hard. You have to but it's knowing you know, what's the right stuff to focus on. And when you talk about fear, I think for me personally, um, the, fear, the, the fear or the vulnerability stuff more comes in leading up to events. I think when I'm in the car, what I have to deal with honestly more, more often is sort of performance and results and like hyper folk being kind of perfectionist mindset. So like developing strategies to really focus on what I need to do and not sort of how I'm feeling. Kind of getting off the feeling stuff is, is what I found the most helpful, but I think all of us are different, right? What works for me might not work for Sage or Callum, you know. And Callum, talking about, Dalton talked about leading up to an event. On the back end of an event, I mean, I think there are days we have all had in the car where you drive the wheels off it and you have a great race as a driver and something goes wrong mechanically through no fault of your own and you don't get the result. Or from the outside, it looks like you screwed up and you have no idea they have no idea, people that are watching at home or even here in the stands have no idea what has gone wrong and it has no fault of your own as a driver. When you go back to the, the bus or the, the hotel or on the flight home and you're, you're reading through social media and you see all of those comments, how important is it for you to have the tools to understand that you're the only one driving the car? You are the guy in the cockpit, how is it how important is it for you to understand that and look at those comments and understand those perspectives through that lens? Yeah, it's a difficult one because, you know, a lot of us probably look at social media and see a comment and want to explain the whole world to them as to, as to why, you know, it's not like that. And of course, that does no good sometimes, you know, you, you normally shoot yourself in the foot a little bit by doing that. But in that way, social media can be brilliant. It can also be a bit destructive, um, especially, you know, the, the European side. We had a lot of exposure from F1 and you'd see a lot of negative comments and it, it would take a toll. And obviously the main thing is to just get off social media. I think for sometimes it's hard as a driver because, you know, you're always as a job having to post stuff, show for your sponsors. But for me, it was like, OK, you know, on these days, maybe maybe a bad day, a Monday after I've messed up, I'll probably take the day off of social media and, and just do some things that work for me. So having got older, spent some more time on my own and also with, with some other people with similar experiences. Uh, for me, it's like either going for a nice walk or even just playing computer games for me is just a good escape. But yeah, as a driver, it's just, it can be super lonely sometimes. So whether you have a sports psychologist, I mean, even, even parents, it can be difficult sometimes because you know, they push for you as well. So when you make a mistake, they'll probably be the first one to comment, oh, you messed up and you go, well, yeah, I, I, know, I, I know I messed up. I mean, it's obvious. Um, but, you know, it's having that support network. I had to work a bit more with my parents as to like, okay, you know, I'm not stupid. I know what I'm doing. I know when I make a mistake and I'm, I wouldn't be where I'm at today, firstly without them, but also with the abilities that I have and knowing how to right my wrongs in that sense. But. Yeah, sports, sports is a lonely world, but it, it can direct you as well. I think I've seen a lot of benefits with, with younger kids that I, I've, well, uh, 
how would I say, been to school with and, you know, struggled a bit and found their feet a little bit more by, by playing sports, by being involved. Um, yeah, because you don't have to just be in it and driving or you could be the engineer. You can, you can be involved and there's a direction that pushes a lot of people. So sports can be, uh, for us, difficult, but also it can be a, a good build up and a good thing to focus on. And from my perspective, racing can be unique in the challenge for the athletes. Because you look at, especially here in the US, the big sports leagues, the NFL, baseball, basketball, hockey, and for every game, every event, half the people are winners. Here in racing, the Indianapolis 500, one of the 33 competitors are the winners. So it can be really isolating, really lonely. Um, and having those tools, having that team to lean on, um, and being able to talk about it and label it and work through those challenges and come out the other side is really important. You, you talked about having the escape. Yeah. How important, what else do you, what other tools do you use for the recovery and to manage your mental health throughout the course of a season, a year, multi, multiple years within your career? Yeah, so for me, one thing is the escape, like we talked, but um, coming back to it, you know, I had a good weekend last weekend here, and, and then coming here for the 500, your goals kind of change and shift. So for me, I like to have my racing goals. I had to like to have my life goals written out. I have a little notebook like you, um, where I can just list, you know, silly things like uh, maybe buying a beach, uh, buying a beach, um, buying a drink on the beach at Tulum or buying a boat, you know, they're, they're my little goals that I, I want to I wanna achieve through my life. But then also in the racing, it's a moving target, you know. For me, the 500 is my second oval race, my first 500. My target's gonna be a lot different than the road course race we just did. Um, and that's where also you, you have to be realistic. If your goal in life is to make money, you've gotta, you've gotta build up, you've gotta focus on the things that are there to achieve it, not the end goal. And, you know, it's it's all those little things. That's why in racing, I think we have so many variables and so many things to focus on that, you know, maybe now that mental health is something that wasn't looked at five years ago as much as it is now. And even, even before that, that this is the fine tuning for us. And, you know, a lot of us, um, a lot of us are looking for everything possible. And if you're not happy in life, it's, that, that's something that's massive and we overlooked it and you know saw it as a weakness so I, I think that the goals is a great thing for me that works I don't know about for you guys as well and Sage you talked about going through that experience and, and that trauma when you were 20 right you were you were young I, re, I remember as your teammate um, as you've gotten older and you've grown and you've worked through that but I mean, you've also recently gotten married and you now have a spouse on your team and a partner and a wife. How does your perspective on life and mental health change as you've, as you've aged, as you've grown, as you've matured? Yeah, I mean, I think I've ultimately just grown with this experience and um, I had to mature, you know, so emotionally along the way and, um, and you know, that can be really hard and, and to do that on your own is hard. Um, but I, yeah, I, I met my wife uh, a few years ago and um, she was a big part of kind of pulling me out of the rut and, and getting me going in the right direction. Um, and we've talked about support system and, and how much that can mean and having just the right people around you. I think when it happened, when I was 20 years old, racing in general is a hard sport for people to relate with us, you know, because it's not like that one sport where you can go in, in middle school or high school and, and just kind of like take it up and you guys are <laughs> driving race cars after school, you know, like it doesn't work like that. So there's not a lot of people that can relate to us other than, you know, your, your other drivers that you're out there with. So, um, you know, I leaned a lot on other drivers and at the time being so young and being new in IndyCar, I didn't have a lot of friends, you know, I, I was friendly obviously with some people and I had teammates but um, as far as like real core friends I didn't have a lot and um, it was only until like a few years ago where I really got like a good group and that I think got me in the right direction as well and um, yeah I think it's it's so important to just kind of like like they were saying just be happy with how you're going in your life whether it's your job or your personal life um, you know I think uh, you need to be happy about something. You need motivation to get out of get out of bed and and uh, push forward in that day. And um, for me, it was uh, I had to find those things. And 
for me, it was like working out really helped out, you know, just kind of like getting going, getting going spiritually um, was a big thing for me. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy where I sit today um, and knowing the journey I went through. It was um, quite a brutal one, but I think it ultimately it made me stronger. And I think, uh, you know, five, six, seven years ago, it would have been tough for me to talk about this because I think it was looked at as a weakness. But I think now um, you're strong, you know, to, to, to be able to publicly say that, you know, you, you might need some help mentally. And to go get that help, I think that's a, that's a strong trait. I don't think that's a weakness. Uh, I agree. And I appreciate your sharing those stories and, and sharing that insight and talking about goals and resources, tools, perspectives. Um, for Dalton, is there anything you'd like to add about not only the preparation for a race, an event, um, you know, maybe a presentation at work, but what really works for you to review things and look back and figure out how to be better uh, the next time and, and come in stronger for the next event? I think kind of touching on what Callum said about setting goals, but for me, it's not not so much the goal, but my perspective on it. Like, for instance, last last, last weekend, you know, we were having a good race, obviously starting towards the back, moving up to the mid-pack, and then I made a mistake, spun out, crashed. You know, it's easy to look at, I think for me, to look at everything as kind of all or nothing. And, you know, racing is a very, like, binary sport. You're the winner or you're not. You know, you finished the race or you didn't. And I think that, like, shifting my perspective from, you know, the results is the only thing that counts to trying to be, you know, A, happy in the moment and B, you know, more satisfied with just focusing on doing it right, um, you know, and even when you have a bad result, having the perspective of, you know, up until that point, I was still driving well, I was still doing it right. So take the positives from that, learn from the mistake and don't let it like stew that, you know, you didn't finish the race or you didn't get the win that you wanted or the result, that, the goal that you'd set, like still take the positives out of the entire experience. I think that helps me kind of have perspective on when we don't have a good weekend. And then between races, I think the, the thing that helps me most really is, you know, looking to the next event and, you know, after you've kind of digested whatever you needed to from the previous event, but really focusing on the preparation and knowing that I'm going into the next weekend as prepared as I can be, whether that's, you know, doing some mindful stuff like breathing, meditating, visualization, like really making sure that I'm mentally prepared for that next event. I think that, that just helps me you know, be happy and feel ready for it kind of thing. I appreciate all of your insights and perspectives, comments, um, tools and thoughts. And I think as we close this portion of the conversation and don't end the conversation by any means, if you need help, there are resources out there, um, please reach out. And I think at the end of the day, it's okay to not be okay. And it's more important that you then ask for help when you need it.